Welcome to the first event of this semester of the Georgetown University Library Associates programs. My name is Artemis Kirk. I'm university librarian and I am thrilled to have you join us for what I know is going to be a wonderful and exciting event. Tonight, the science of chocolate. Who doesn't like chocolate? <laughs> this evening's uh, program is presented thanks to the hard work of many people and I'd like to be sure to thank them all first. Library staff members Jessica Pierce, Tess Winkler, Grace McKinney, and David Hagen and Barrington Baines. The Blummer family, of course, and the Blummer, Ch Blummer Corporation. And you all, the library associates, who are a group of friends and supporters of the library, who make possible these engaging and thought-provoking and tonight very exciting events. Your support is crucial to the library. And if any of you who are here now who aren't students would like to join the Library Associates, please speak to one of us afterward. We'd be delighted to talk to you more about our programs. Tonight is a treat. This event was planned because of several intertwining ideas. First, what better opportunity to bring a program about science and chocolate than the construction of our new science building, which is going up just like that on campus. Science is a major focus of Georgetown. And as we look to expand our science faculty, more and more resources will be devoted to enhancing the sciences here. Another reason we generated the idea of the science of chocolate is because of the university's relationship with the Blummer family. They are near and dear to Georgetown, not only because of their splendid and enviable business in chocolate, but also because members of the Blummer family have been Hoyas for nearly 100 years. This includes a current Georgetown student, Michael Blummer, joining the tradition. Mike, where are you? <laughs> the family's philanthropy to Georgetown began in the 1950s, when Henry J. Blummer Sr., from the class of 1926, put his corporate airplane at the service of former President Father Edward Bunn, as Father Bunn went on fundraising trips. If that wasn't enough, when the Rice Science Building was erected in 1962, Mr. Blummer and his wife, Viola, supported the creation of the Blummer Science Library, which bears the family name. The linkage of science and philanthropy assists our ability to strengthen Georgetown's position as one of the top research universities in the nation, thanks to people like the Blummers and to our faculty and to some of our wonderful staff. I'm pleased to recognize the head of the Blummer Science Library, Gwen Owens, who is the brilliant steward of the Blummer's ongoing gifts to the library and whose expertise keeps this library an invaluable service to Georgetown's faculty, students, and researchers. Another confluence for this event is, of course, Valentine's Day. Many of us will likely be indulging in the decadent temptations of the many fine chocolate companies for which the Blummer Corporation creates the main ingredient. But finally, at Georgetown, we have a number of chocolate aficionados and connoisseurs, some of whom are here this evening. They include the university's chaplain to the staff, Father Francis Schemmel, who makes delectable treats to share with the Georgetown community using, of course, Blummer chocolate. Father Schemmel, where are you? The chair of the anthropology department at Georgetown, Dr. Susan Terrio, published a book called Crafting the Culture and History of French Chocolate, which is an anthropological and cultural study of the multiple issues faced by chocolatier in France. Dr. Terry, are you here? Coming soon. And though he's unable to join us this evening, the university's provost, Jim O'Donnell, is Georgetown's chocoholic in chief who, in addition to his scholarly publishing, has written articles on the best chocolate shops to visit around the world. The Blummer Chocolate Company is the largest processor of ingredient, chocolate, and cocoa-related pro products in North America, with five manufacturing facilities in the U.S. and Canada. This evening's talk will focus appropriately for an academic institution on the science of chocolate, and we are privileged to have three of Blummer Chocolate's key officers as our speakers. Stephen Blummer, a 1989 graduate of Georgetown, is the Vice President of Operations for Blummer Chocolate Company. He started his career with Blummer in 1995 and has held positions in sales, marketing, and operations management. 
Steve currently serves on the board of directors of several organizations, including the PMCA, which is an international organization of candy manufacturers, and the Upper Perkiomen Chamber of Commerce. Peter Blummer is the president and chief operating officer of the Blummer Chocolate Company, starting his career in 1991 after graduating from Georgetown in 1985 and in 1989 from the Harvard Business School. Some of us have heard of that. He has held positions in operations management, cocoa procurement, and sales. Peter has served on the executive committee of the World Cocoa Foundation as, and was one of its founding members. He has served as chairman of the Chocolate Manufacturers Association, chairman of the NCA Chocolate Council, and chairman of this PMCA. Peter is also a current member of the Georgetown University Board of Regents. Rose Potts holds the, the enviable, enviable position of Corporate Manager of Sensory and Product Guidance for Blummer Chocolate. Rose holds a degree in food science from the Pennsylvania State University and has worked for the Blummer Chocolate Company for over 25 years. Her work has provided the opportunity to conduct chocolate training and taste seminars within the Blummer Company as well as for candy manufacturers at their conventions. She has led various seminars on chocolate tasting, chocolate and wine tasting, sugar-free products, and chocolate trends. I want that job. <laughs> Therefore, it's a great privilege and pleasure for me to introduce to you Peter Blummer, Stephen Blummer, and Rose Potts of the Blummer Corporation. Thank you, Artemis, and thank you to the Library Associates for inviting us uh, this evening. Uh, we're really pleased to be here and, uh, and talk about a topic that's really near and dear to our hearts, the science of chocolate. Uh, when I meet someone for the first time and they ask me what I do for work, it is without fail that my answer brings a smile to their face. I make chocolate. What's not to like about that? Tonight we will share with you where cacao comes from, some of the ancient uh, medicinal uses for cacao, how the organic compounds are affecting our perceptions while eating chocolate, and where the current science and genome research uh, is taking us into the future of health and wellness. And of course, we'll conclude with a chocolate tasting. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge, as Artemis uh, mentioned, um, in many ways the, the building blocks for Blummer Chocolate started here at Georgetown uh, since the founders of the company uh, our uh, alumni of Georgetown, uh, our grandfather Henry, and his two brothers, uh, Byrne and Al. Uh, their uh, entre entrepreneurial spirit is what started Blummer Chocolate, and that spirit uh, has been sustained within our family and is alive in the business today. They also began the Blummer family legacy at Georgetown, again, uh, which Artemis uh, mentioned. Um, it spans four generations of Blummers. Uh, as, as you can see here, and uh, Mike, uh, uh, class of, not, of uh, uh, 2013 and a future chocolatier uh, is in, in the crowd as well. Uh, up next is Peter Blummer, uh, who is going to share some insight into our passion, chocolate. So before I get started, I just have a, a quick informal uh, poll or survey I'd like to, I'd like to take. So the presentation's title is The Science of Chocolate. So just a show of hands, who came for the science? <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I figured there'd be some. And, and who came for the chocolate? Okay. I thought so. Um, so those of you who came for the science, you won't be disappointed because we, uh, we're Rose Potts, when she uh, speaks, will certainly give you many more reasons to enjoy and, uh, and uh, eat chocolate. And for those of you who came for the chocolate, yes, as Steve said, we will be eating chocolate, so you certainly will not be disappointed. Um, before we get to the, the science, um, I, you can't talk about chocolate without talking about the romance of chocolate. And um, for me, that begins with the, the origin countries. Um, and I'll take you through some of the, you know, what is a, where, where does a cocoa bean, cocoa bean come from and how is it processed? Um, and then we'll get into the science with Rose. So, uh, cocoa was grown in a, uh, a narrow band around the equator, about 10 degrees plus or minus uh, north or south uh, of the equator. Uh, primary cocoa growing regions 
uh, from a, a size standpoint would be in, in the West African region, Ivory Coast, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, Cam Cameroon, and then uh, Indonesia is one of the, the larger uh, sources. Um, in South America, Ecuador is, is, uh, and Brazil are really the main sources of, uh, of cocoa. Of course, it's grown in a lot of different, uh, di different origins, and if, if you're a, a chocolate aficionado and have tasted um, the different cocoa origin uh, chocolates, uh, you can tell there's a real difference with each one. Um, the cocoa begins with a pod, uh, the fruit uh, that's grown on the, uh, the cocoa tree, and uh, it grows on the trunk and the branches of the tree. That pod is then harvested, and you, you can see here is the, uh, the beans. They're coated in a, a mucilage, a pulp, uh, which is really important for a further uh, stage, which I'll describe in just a minute. There are about 40 beans, plus or minus, uh, per, uh, per pod. So, the beans are harvested, or the pods are harvested, and the beans are taken out. You can see this picture of um, a, a village cooperative harvesting, uh, harvesting the cocoa. Here's uh, another picture. And you can see the, um, you know, the pods in the back, and this woman is, is taking the, the beans out uh, to ultimately be um, fermented. Um, let's just see. So the fermentation process and, and by the way, there is some science along the way here. Um, so I'll give you a few tidbits of, science, of the science of chocolate uh, before we get to, uh, to Rose's presentation. It's sort of a warm-up act. Um, so in the fermentation process, it's, it's a key step in the flavor development of chocolate. Uh, if you get this wrong, there's nothing you can do further downstream to get it right and to, you know, to give you the flavor of chocolate that you, uh, that you expect. So in the fermentation process, essentially, we're taking the, the carbohydrates, which are converting into alcohol and, uh, and CO2, and that further reacts into uh, the uh, acetic acid and into some compounds that are flavor precursors called uh, pyrazines. Um, the cocoa then is dried, and the moisture content in the bean is reduced from about 20% down to about 8%, so it's suitable, it's stable. Uh, the bean won't deteriorate or get moldy uh, in that state, and that's, then it's export ready. So a couple of close-up shots of beans. So when the beans get to our factory, we clean the beans, um, and then we roast them. And that's another key step in the, in the flavor development for chocolate. And again, the science of, of roasting uh, is these pyrazines, these uh, uh, flavor compounds, react under heat, and they're really what give us the chocolate flavors uh, that, are, that are inherent in, uh, in, the, in the bean. Once we roast the bean, we deshell the bean, and we're left with something that's called the nib, or the meat of the bean. And that um, consists of about 50% cocoa butter, and 50% cocoa solids, but it's, it's, a, it's a hard bean. And in the process of grinding in equipment like this, we fracture the, um, the solid structure and release the fat, and of course with heat, that melts the fat, and you end up with a, a very uh, fine liquor, or liquid rather, uh, which we call chocolate liquor. And of course it has no, you know, no alcoholic content, but that's the technical term for uh, what you might see uh, in the, in the uh, supermarket aisles as unsweetened baking chocolate. So that's, the, that's the, then the base ingredient from which you, you make chocolate. With the chocolate liquor, we add various ingredients. If it's dark chocolate, you add um, you know, sugar, basically, uh, and different, different bean blends or different liquor blends to, to get the, the right flavor that, uh, that you're looking for. Um, or milk chocolate, obviously, you're adding sugar and, and milk powders. And we make a paste, which we refine on a five-roll refiner. And that's what ultimately gives us the, uh, we're reducing the particle size, and that's what gives us the, um, the creamy texture of chocolate in its finished form. And then the final step is uh, the conging or mixing process. And in this step, we're, we're taking that paste that's been refined, and we're putting a lot of energy into it in a, in a high shear mixing uh, step. And again, there's science in this step too. Um, what's happening is the, as, you're, as you're generating the heat 
uh, through the shearing process, you're actually um, driving off the low boiling point volatiles. Um, so some of the remaining acetic acid uh, from the fermentation process that if it were kept in the chocolate you would have, uh, it can create sour notes. And so you're driving off some of the, some of the off notes uh, in these low boiling point volatiles. Um, and uh, for, especially in a milk chocolate, uh, if you drive enough shear and energy into the mass, you create the Maillard reaction, which is where you get a caramelization uh, flavor, and that's really the, uh, the amino acids and sugar and, and um, uh, carbohydrates in the sugar in the milk um, that react over time you know, due, due to uh, the heat. So that's a little bit of the science, uh, and, and that's your chocolate 101. Um, so I think that's it. Um, now we'll, uh, after my warm-up act, we'll actually get to Rose and give you uh, a little bit more technical information on the, the real science behind chocolate. second. Well, I'm so happy to see you all this evening. It's pretty cold out there, but um, you know, chocolate warms our hearts, so we're, we're glad to be here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk, first of all, about, um, refer to it as chocolate's healthy halo. I'm going to start talking about a little bit about chocolate's history as it relates to health. I'm going to talk more so about free radicals and polyphenols because that's what we hear all the time in the news and we might need to hear a little more about it to understand what that really means for us. And then of course we're going to taste some chocolate. So hang in there, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, so Peter asked, who likes chocolate? So he sort of stole my thunder because I was going to have that voting there. But you're not alone. Chocolate is the number one craved flavor in the world, actually. And it's been craved and coveted for hundreds of years. And it all started out really with the Aztecs and the Mayans. And um, they actually started using it more for its medicinal value because they noticed that you know it gave them more energy. They used it as an aphrodisiac. But it's also they noticed that it also gave them, um, you know, reduced their heart palpitations and it just made them feel better. And chocolate today is really just getting back to its roots. And what I mean by that is really, chocolate really does all this stuff. It's just that today we have scientific evidence and studies <coughs> that have come out to back this up. So we're going to talk about that a little more. Another thing we've learned today is that no, not only eating chocolate makes us feel good, but just the smell or the sight of it can increase the tryptophan, which reduces our anxiety, or it can also release um, endorphins, which is the same thing that releases when we're falling in love. So we in the industry, of course, would prefer that you just not look at it and smell it, we'd like you to buy it. But, you know, it, you can get a little bit of the effect just by looking at it. Okay, so let's talk about a modern day example. There is an indigenous population off the coast of Panama who their diet is very high in salt. However, they consume five cups of cocoa per day. And what's, what's unique about that is that, like most of us Americans, as we age, unfortunately, our blood pressure tends to rise. This population, that does not happen. But if these people leave their environment and stop this cocoa consumption and move somewhere else, their blood pressure goes up just like the rest of us. So this is kind of a unique modern day study to sort of show us some of the things that can happen. All right, so before I move on, I want to remind us of some not so cheery facts, okay? Heart disease is the number one killer of men and women in the United States. And some things that can contribute to that are the inflammation of our blood vessels, the high blood pressure that I talked about, high cholesterol, and of course some other things too. So we're talking about cholesterol. I want to talk a little bit about the, mi the macronutrients that are available in chocolate. And you see I have different, there's different um, products up here. I'm going to talk mostly about cocoa powder. The reason for that is the, um, the good stuff, 
and chocolate or the nutrients, they are housed mostly in the solid portion. So cocoa powder gives you the most bang for your buck because it has the most solids. So you can see here that, um, oops, that the uh, cocoa powder does not have any cholesterol. Those of you that are on top of these things, you know, well, no kidding, it has no cholesterol. Peter just showed us that it's from a plant. You only get cholesterol from animal products. But if you go ahead and make that into a chocolate and add milk, it will have cholesterol, obviously, from the milk product. So just something for you to think about. And while we're talking about fat, Peter also said that the cocoa bean is about 50% fat. Well, when we're making cocoa powder, we actually remove some of that fat. So again, with the cocoa powder, has not really a lot of fat. The cocoa powder, most of the cocoa powders that you would buy in the grocery store have 10 to 12% fat left in them. Um, but again, when we make chocolate, we like that nice creamy rich flavor. We're gonna add some of that cocoa butter back. And also with um, milk chocolate, we have the milk fat that's in there. So I'm blending it all in the milk right now. So. <laughs> Okay, and you can also see, oh, I also have one here about the saturated fat. Um, when talking about saturated fat, it's really important to talk about the lipid composition of cocoa butter. Cocoa butter is really a very unique fat. It has a melting point just about our body temperature. That's why when we put it in our mouth, you get that nice, smooth, creamy melt. Very convenient. Um, additionally to that, it's mostly, 35% of it, um, a good portion of it is stearic acid. Now, stearic acid is saturated. Most of us know that saturated fats are not necessarily good for us because they usually raise our cholesterol. However, stearic acid, which is part of the cocoa butter, does not do that. So it's sort of unique. It has either a neutral effect on our um, um, cholesterol, or it actually raises the HDLs, which are the high-density lipoproteins, which are the good cholesterol. Just good stuff to know. You know, this makes us feel a little better about our choices of something we enjoy. All right, just a little bit about the mineral content. Um, minerals, we don't need a lot of these minerals. That's mostly why they're called, referred to as trace minerals. But just, just so you know, again, we're gonna stick with the cocoa powder because that's where the bang for the buck is, the most solids. Talk about copper. Copper, uh, chocolate is actually the number one source of copper in the American diet. Um, copper, if, if we don't have copper at all, it can um, contribute to cardiovascular disease. Again, we don't need much of it, however. Chocolate also has some magnesium, which we refer to as nature's muscle relaxant. Relaxant, it also helps reduce stress and can help with um, stave off insulin resistance. We also have some potassium in there, and most of us also know that if you have any sort of a heart condition, they recommend that you eat bananas, and that's because they're high in potassium. Um, chocolate does have some potassium, and it helps regulate your blood pressure. I'll let you take a second to read that. But we, refer, we can refer to chocolate as smart food. You can see some of you can see what it says. Uh, maybe not in the back. Um, but what happens is, it's chocolate, because of the antioxidants, helps um, stimulate the flow of blood to our brain which can sort of help protect us against memory loss. It also can protect us against amyloid uh, plaque damage, which is um, amyloid plaque is, is protein that is found in um, some Alzheimer's patients' brains. So if we want to reduce this, it's, it's still sort of, um, you know, anecdotal evidence at this point, but we should all try to do the best we can. All right, another recent study that was out was by the, uh, the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology, and it was in March of last year. And they decided and had studies that antioxidants, especially in chocolate, can help the skin's natural ultraviolet protection. Again, we're not advocating that you don't wear sunscreen, but again, a little bit of help from your food or what you're taking every day, of course, can't hurt us, would be good for us. <laughs> Additionally, um, the British Medical Journal has put together had put together several years ago um, the recommendations of 
not only taking in, most of us would like to just take a vitamin with everything we need. Like that's so much easier than eating all these things we're supposed to eat. And so that they referred to as taking a poly pill. What they actually recommended was the poly meal concept, whereas you take a little bit of all these different foods, because it's not just the individual nutrients, but it's the special interaction in which the foods are that really gets it there. And you know, lucky for us, wine and chocolate made the list. Of course, fruits and vegetables, as they can help, um, you know, they're cancer fighting. Um, garlic, because they're any carcinogenic. And you know, fish for the omega threes for our heart and eyes. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the antioxidants. I keep referring to this. This is this is where the big deal is with chocolate. Well, to get to the antioxidants, we have to talk about the oxidants. So a free radical and an oxidant are the same thing. And what they are is that these are highly reactive and unstable um, molecules that can lead to the degeneration of our cells over time. In fact, in fact, it's cumulative over time. So we, we get some of these antioxidants every day. It could be from the sun, um, from foods we eat, from toxins, and just from stress in general. So it's just a natural degeneration of cells. So anything we can do to combat this, because it's coming at us every day, is helpful. So again, these antioxidants, you have these free radicals and oxidants. These are the bad guys. That's why they're fighting down here at the bottom. And then on the other side, you have the antioxidants, which are trying to combat this every day. Um, so the antioxidants help reduce inflammation, reduce the cholesterol, reduce blood pressure, and reduce protein clumping, which can lead to cataracts. Um, and what they do is um, the antioxidants actually bind with the oxidants, so it, which another name for that is free radicals, so that they're no longer free to attack our cells. That's sort of how I think of it. Another way to think of it is think about an apple. If you cut an apple in half and you let it out in the oxygen, it will turn brown. That's because an oxidation reaction is occurring. If you apply um, lemon juice, which has vitamin C, which is an antioxidant, it stops this reaction. So it's a matter of which would you rather look like? The withered up brown apples <laughs> or the nice crisp apple. So, but in, in anything that you can do to get these antioxidants into your body is going to be a positive thing. Okay, so polyphenols. What are polyphenols? Polyphenols, we have antioxidants up here, and then underneath that umbrella, we have a class of polyphenols. So, polyphenols are antioxidants, and then there's different kinds of those too. So, the ones that we're interested in mostly in chocolate are the epicatechins, the capicat the catechins and the proanthocyanidins, which we have up here. And again, the types of polyphenols. This picture reminds us that um, the source of polyphenols, it's all about color. The deeper, the richer the color, the more polyphenols there are. So if you have a red apple versus a light-skinned apple, the red apple is going to have more antioxidants. So if you have red grapes versus white grapes, the red grapes, so that means red wine versus white wine, okay, uh, is going to have more antioxidants. It's the same with milk chocolate and dark chocolate. A dark chocolate is going to have more antioxidants than the milk chocolate. And now I've just told you anything with color has any antioxidants, and, but you say chocolate is brown. Well, it's brown at the end. But the cocoa beans, in their natural state, before they're roasted, the roasting is what actually turns them brown. If you cut them on the inside, they're very they're multicolored. And the different coloration actually helps indicate to us um, the different degree of fermentation. And the beans from the different areas of the world that Peter talked about, we would expect them to look differently on the inside. And from what they look like on the inside, with the different colors, they may be pink, purple, yellow, brown, we can kind of predict, or try to predict, what they're going to taste like in the end. And that's actually how we evaluate the cocoa beans to buy, to decide if we want them to produce the chocolate that we're trying to produce. Um, so they start out with color. So the color theory still works. OK. Since this is a science of chocolate, I had to show you a gratuitous organic chem. <laughs> and way back when, I used to exactly know what was going on here. But anyway, these are the sites that um, the, the antioxidants 
would bind with the oxidants so that they would not break down the systems in your body. All right, unfortunately, there are, there are things that can affect the antioxidant activity in any food. And particularly in chocolate, there are some. Um, the amount of cocoa solids can, and I'm gonna explain a little bit in a minute, um, cocoa mass, um, and what that is. So the more cocoa mass, the more, or the more cocoa solids, the more um, antioxidants there's going to be. Um, a process called alkalizing, if you've ever had like red velvet cake, a particular kind of cocoa that's in there that makes it red, that process unfortunately reduces the antioxidants. Um, also the degree of fermentation. Unfortunately, um, good fermentation that's gone its way produces flavor. Unfortunately, it reduces the antioxidants somewhat. So it's, you know, it's a fine line as to, you know, we want the flavor, but we want to preserve antioxidants too. And the same goes with temperature. Peter showed you a picture of um, a pretreatment for roasting, and roasting actually reduces the antioxidants also. So the lower the roast, generally speaking, the more antioxidants that are pres preserved. Okay, so I said about cocoa mass. Now they're going to be um, handing out to you two different dark chocolates. Now this is where the control comes in. If anybody's ever had a dog where they put the biscuit on top of the nose, <laughs> this is a little bit like that, okay? So, um, like I said, you get two different tro dark chocolates. I'm going to trust that you're going to know which is which. Um, the one that you're getting that I believe is on the clear plate um, I believe that one is called Revere. That's just what we, the name, is it? Is that what it says? Okay. The name that we call it. So wait until you get your second piece and then we'll taste them all together. Again, this is the dog with the thing on his <laughs> Now, the reason I'm, I'm showing you these two chocolates and why we're going to taste them is I'm going to talk to you about what cocoa mass is. Cocoa mass is the sum of all things that come from the cocoa bean in a chocolate. So, if you've ever seen a chocolate bar that says 72%, 60%, 55%, 88%, that's referring to the cocoa mass. Now, the thing is, it depends on where the beans were selected from that make that chocolate. So you could have two chocolates with the same cocoa mass, but that tastes very differently and have a very different intensity in chocolate. So, if everybody has their chocolate, I see it's still coming around, you can taste it now. <laughs> and while you're doing that, if you can taste and answer this question, which you're not supposed to, because I always yell at our panel when we talk, or we're supposed to be tasting. <laughs> Uh, show of hands, how many people prefer milk chocolate? Oh, not too many, not too many. Who prefers dark chocolate? Let's see them high. All right. Now, not to generalize, but the dark preference usually increases with what I call palate maturity. <laughs> so that may be somewhat a reflection of our demographic, but that just means that we have developed our palate. Um, and generally, typical American chocolates, I would say, are in the 50 to 60 percent range. High cocoa mass usually means greater than 60. The two chocolates that you have are in the 70 percent range. If you had the Revere chocolate first, which I forgot to tell them what order to hand them out in, um, you may have noticed that one to be a little milder. Now, depending on your preference, that may be, have been your preference. The second one, or depending on what order you had them, um, the other one that says organic dark, is probably a little bit more of a roller coaster ride. A little more interesting, that one. And that has nothing to do with the fact that it's organic. It just so happens that the beans come from different parts of the world that we've used for those. So the ones in the Revere are um, more of a crowd <coughs> pleaser, I would say. Um, more people the majority of dark chocolate users would like that. The other one is maybe not liked by everybody, 
but the people who like that one are probably very passionate about it and hide it in the drawer in their desk. <laughs> I know someone who does that. <laughs> All right. So did everyone get their chocolate? You're feeling a little better now? You're feeling those antioxidants going? Your brain's just sparking? Okay. All right. And I just have here, the percent of Americans who are preferring dark chocolate is actually rising. And there's several reasons for that. Um, it has to do with, again, our palate maturity. But also, think about the food network. I mean, we are all coming, becoming more educated consumers of food. We want to know about things. We want to experience things. So that's part of it, too. I think in our review of the antioxidants, they're cancer-fighting because they can reduce the inflammation, reduce the cholesterol, and reduce the blood pressure. And we talked about you know, protecting against the memory loss. And this is just citing a study. There was a study done by Swiss researchers of um, people who smoke. And um, the reason that they chose this group is because it, it compromises the flexibility of the blood vessels. For healthiness, we want flexible blood vessels. <coughs> um, and it lasted for eight hours. That's the good news. That's also the good news for us who make chocolate. That means you have to dose every eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we talked about the colors. Food with color has more antioxidants. This is just a little comparison. We have red wine versus dark chocolate, and this is per serving. Either one of these products is fine, obviously. And consumed together is quite delightful, too. I have a picture here of blueberries, because blueberries is considered one of the super fruits. And they've done a really good job getting their word out there. And there's, they're good for so many different reasons. Um, but again, these are part of the superfruit, superfruits like pomegranates, acai. Um, and the health and wellness-seeking customer, consumer, is, knows about this and will, will go after this. Just this week, there was a study that came out, um, the Hershey Company actually did, and it was a study of cocoa powder versus fruit powders, and they actually found that cocoa powder had more antioxidant activity gram per gram. So that was kind of exciting. So um, this is a chart. Again, I don't know if you can read this, but um, the one on the left is dark chocolate, and then the next one is milk chocolate. And then we have prunes, raisins, blueberries, which are a miracle fruit, but they're down there, uh, blackberries, raspberries, let's go back here, and plums, but it just shows a comparison, and this is per 100 grams. So I said before, when the brain, when, when chocolate is eaten, the brain emits chemicals sim similar to falling in love, increases our endorphins. Um, consumers not only want products that taste good, but make them feel good today. They're not happy with them just tasting good. So. Are we ready for a little more chocolate? Or you, I still see eating going on out there. You're savoring it. That's, that's good. That's good. All right. I'll read it for you. It says, he said chocolate is good for the health, Mommy. Can I have another dose of it? Yes, we're going to get to that. All right. I want to talk a little bit about sensory and the methodology. There's different ways to evaluate things for flavor. This is not what we're going to do today. This is one day, one way to do it. You know, one of these things is not like the other. Get the one that's different. That's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is talk about ca capturing all the sensory stimuli, taste, touch, sound, sight, and smell, because of the experience. We like to experience it all. So just some things to um, think about when you're tasting. If you're really tasting, not eating, this is tasting, it's different. So you're thinking about what you're doing. You shouldn't have any food or drink about 30 minutes beforehand, especially things like coffee and cola, because um, that really can influence your ability to taste uh, bitterness. And if we do, like we did two samples, I forgot to tell them which order to put them in. That makes a lot of difference, because there's something called flavor carryover between samples. Take your time. This is a definitely a no smartphone zone. So take your eyes off of it and put it away because it really, we really can't think 
and read that at the same time. We really can't, no matter what we tell ourselves. And usually we would have water in between samples or we would have apples or something to sort of cleanse the palate. So we're going to get back to the romance a little bit. So when you're tasting chocolate or chocolates, you have to think about what you like. You know, what makes each thing special for you? I mean, that's why there are a variety in the box chocolates. If we all like the same thing, we'd all only have to make one kind, right? So is it the unique shape? Some of us may be attracted to the particular shape of a piece that we like. Or is it the snap when we break the dark chocolate? Or is it the crunch? Do we like the texture or the crunchiness? You didn't know chocolate made sound, did you? Or is it the slight grain of the center? Some chocolatiers actually leave the center of their chocolate just a little grainy, which, which what it does, it evokes the feeling of being homemade, and it gives people, reminds them of the memory of maybe having um, something in a grandmother's kitchen. And that evokes something different than perhaps the smooth and creamy chocolatier type. Or sometimes we're intrigued by the difference in texture. It could be the melting of the outside versus the crunchiness of the inside. That keeps it exciting for some of us. All right, we're going to have another chocolate now. We can have the milk chocolate come out. You see some motion back there? We're ready for the milk chocolate? What? Nope. Oh, okay. They did it. Okay. I'm sorry. See, I can't see you all. I'm looking at this. Um, okay. So if you had the milk chocolate, you need to let it, or chocolate in general, to really evaluate it. Let it melt on your tongue. And then you think about the words that come to your mind to describe it. This is what we call our wheel of flavor with chocolate. There's all sorts of different terms on here um, that you might want to choose. Some of you might be familiar with the, the wheel of, um, for the wine wheel that has the different flavors on it. It's very similar to that. Those are just some of the same ones. <laughs> so really, um, some say at the cosmetics counter, they offer hope. <laughs> Some say at the candy counter, they offer happiness. <laughs> well, the chocolate counter, we have hope, happiness, and a tribute to your health, too. But really, you know, when it all comes down to it, <laughs> it's still all about the taste. So we want to leave you with increased happiness, increased health, and hopefully you'll buy increased chocolate too. <laughs> Thank you. I'm still eating chocolate. I didn't see yummy as one of those <laughs> sensations, but this chocolate tasting has been wonderful. Peter and Stephen and Rose have agreed to take questions from us. And so if you have chocolate questions, please, this is your chance. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the uh, mucilage, the film on the beans, was used at some point in the processing. I missed what that was. Is this hot? I don't know. OK. Um, yeah, so the, the mucilage around the bean is actually uh, used in the fermentation process. It's, um, you know, it essentially helps create the, uh, the, the, the fermentation process that it, the, I think that in Rose you can help me there's uh, yeah the carbohydrates and the, the yeast uh, that are naturally in that pulp uh, are what really trigger the, um, the fermentation process so that's really once once the, the fermentation process is complete that usually it's just really um, it's 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 evaporated in, in, in essence yeah, it's gone because it's turned into, you know, the various compounds that I mentioned, uh, the alcohol, acetic acid, CO2. And so the bean that I showed some close-ups that did not have any of the um, 
of the mucilagina. It was just because it had gone through the fermentation process. Thank you. I was wondering how the process from getting the bean in the beginning into the very finished product, how that's changed over the years in the company. Interesting. <laughs> um, not very much. <laughs> And if you're talking about the, are you talking about the supply chain at origin, the, the uh, or, or you mean actually how we get it into the plant? Or just all aspects of The whole process. big machinery there. I didn't know if you had that a long time ago. Oh, sure. Well, at the plant, obviously, there's, you know, uh, technology and engineering has is, is advanced considerably. I, um, you know, Hershey was famous for, if you've ever seen these pictures of these longitudinal conges, <coughs> big open, almost like troughs with these rollers, granite rollers, and they would conge the chocolate for days. Well, you know, now the conge that I showed you, um, it's modern technology, you can accomplish, accomplish the same thing in, in hours. And so certainly the, the, um, the equipment the, the, is, is highly engineered now and, and very precisely controlled, um, you know, from, with computers. But when you go back to the uh, origin countries, you know, remarkably, um, there has not been uh, the kind of advance that, frankly, we'd like to see um, in the farming practices. And, and the, the challenge with, with cocoa um, uh, as a crop is it's generally a smallholder crop. And so you're not talking about sophisticated farmers with plantations and technology and knowledge. You're talking about um, family farms that are a few uh, acres where they're also growing some plantain and, and other crops and um, and not often the, the, the knowledge is not passed down uh, you know from generation to generation and so what we have is a crop that uh, where 40 percent of the, the actual crop potential is lost due to pest and disease and that was the case a hundred years ago it's the case today and and so that's why uh, some of the things that we're doing as an industry, as a company, are really focused on bringing some basic technologies to farmers um, through the cooperatives and, and villages. And it's critical because if we don't do that, um, we can't meet the growing consumption of, of, uh, of chocolate, especially in the developing world. And more importantly, um, you really want to make sure that you have a healthy cocoa um, uh, farm uh, community. I mean, it's so. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I took it to a couple of different directions. That's, that's the cocoa butter that we'll put back into the chocolate manufacturer. This chocolate, um, we make it in different viscosities depending on what it's going to be made for. So some of it takes quite a bit of cocoa butter to make it thin. If you were going to put a thin coating on um, something versus if you wanted it to be thick to make chocolate chips, that's how you get the curl. If it's too thin, it's just flat. So that's what it's used for. It can also be sold to the cosmetic industry. I was just wondering where modern chocolate uh, sources its beans, and are there distinct flavor profiles for each of the major regions like South America, Africa, Indonesia, uh, that make a different flavored chocolate depending upon where in the world your beans are coming from? Um, the two dark chocolates that we tasted, I could have talked about that a little more, I suppose. And the one that was marked Revere, that was predominantly West African. Uh, whereas the other one was a blend of South American beans, which is why it had a little more character to it. And, and each region of the world, and even there's like sort of microclimates within there, will produce uh, different flavors. We expect, generally speaking, certain flavors from certain areas of the world, but it is an agricultural crop, so from year to year it does vary a bit. And that's why we maintain certain blends so that we end up with um, you know, a similar flavor from year to year. It's quite a challenge. Yeah, I, 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 if, if you haven't um, picked up in, uh, in the stores some of the origin chocolates, um, 
I encourage you to do it. It's 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 like having a you know a wine tasting. They're they're they are so different. Uh, you know, you get a, a very uh, vin vanilla infused flavor from Madagascar versus a very chocolatey. Um, uh, uh, mild flavor from West Africa versus a very uh, fruity flavor from Ecuador or some of the Caribbean uh, islands. And so they, they are very different. Thank you. Uh, Jim, you have any tips on like, when you're tasting chocolate, how do you get the most flavor out of it? Sure. Um, it's best to have it to be at least room temperature because if it's cold, it doesn't, you know, emit the flavor in your mouth so well, and it, and it melts slower. Um, we actually do a lot of tasting of chocolate liquid because it's faster, um, and you really get the volatiles, so you get um, a good hit of flavors. Um, usually, we do mild chocolates to more intense. So we did everything sort of backwards today, where we did the milk last. Generally, you would do milk chocolates first and then sort of work your way up through more robust darks. Uh, this one's for Rose. Um, <laughs> back when I was younger, uh, my dad would always come home with um, this big kind of jar just labeled flavonoids. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> he'd never tell me what it was. He would just eat it by the spoonful. It was really nasty. But um, I, I noticed it on your presentation that I mean, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about what that is. <laughs> well, I have no idea what your father was eating. <laughs> and I had some good experiences with um, cocoa butter with your father, but I'll tell you about that later. <laughs> um, but I, I, honestly, I don't know. He probably just had cocoa nibs in a jar. So actually, we have a jar of cocoa beans that we have somewhere if anyone wants to look at them. And we also have cocoa nibs. Cocoa nibs are the inside or the roasted part minus the shell. So we have them somewhere to look at. Uh, tell me a little bit about white chocolate. Is it really chocolate? Go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I think it was in the 90s, actually. There was no such thing as white chocolate until then. And then Hershey petitioned to get that to be defined. Um, the different types of chocolate, as a lot of the different types of foods, they have a standard of identity that must be met to be able to call it that. So for instance, um, milk chocolate has to have a certain percentage of milk and a certain percentage of cocoa solids to be called milk chocolate. You can only have cocoa butter. It can't have any substitute for the fats. If it doesn't have cocoa butter in it, it cannot be called chocolate. It could be called chocolatey, <laughs> chocolate-like. So when you, you know, if you're looking for a real chocolate, you want to check your label and check to see what it says on the front. It doesn't say chocolate, it's not. But as far as white chocolate goes, um, white chocolate must have cocoa butter. Um, there's no cocoa solids in there, and that's why it's white. But it has its own standard of identity now. So it, it has to have cocoa butter and not any other type of food. Uh, can you speak a little more about the health effects? Um, it's not going to affect my consumption of chocolate. <laughs> I'm going to keep eating as much of it as I can to try to reach the level of benefit. But, but are there any studies that show how much chocolate we need to be consuming to have those effects? Sure, actually, I don't have my slide up here. There is a, a good website from the National Confectioners Association, and they have a lot of the studies on there that you can access. And it, it de it's very dependent on the type of chocolate. I talked about the different things that can affect the amount of antioxidants that are in it. So that has a lot of effect to it. So it's hard to say you can eat so much of chocolate and you'll get this effect. It's very dependent on the type of chocolate and how it's been processed and the type of beans that were used. So it's very specific. Yeah. So, so absolutely, if you're, if you're uh, looking for chocolate that you want to eat on a daily basis for that, uh, you know, for the health effect, I mean, I have a friend who has high blood pressure and he drinks red wine and, and high cocoa mass dark chocolate every day and uh, it, it has had a, 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 a lowering effect on his, on his uh, blood pressure. So you want to look at the label and make sure that uh, in the ingredient statement, as, as, as Rose said previously, 
you want to make sure, number one, that it's high cocoa mass. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people will say something above 70%. Um, and you want to make sure that the ingredient, on the ingredient statement, it does not say alkalized anywhere on that. Because uh, as Rose mentioned, if it's alkalized, then you've really lowered the, um, the amount of, of um, uh, polyphenols uh, in, the, uh, in the chocolate. And, and what amount is your friend <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't remember that. And, and also, uh, when, when cocoa is, uh, when chocolate is processed into things like those luscious, rich, dark, flourless chocolate cakes and chocolate mousse and things like that, are we getting any benefit? <laughs> I'll eat them anyway. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you have to sort of balance it. We're, we're not saying that chocolate is a health food, but if you're going to eat it anyway, which most of us are, you want to at least know what, you know, what it's giving to. If you're having a flourless chocolate cake, that's, it's a pound of chocolate, dark chocolate. It's a pound of butter <laughs> and eight eggs. So that's probably not a health food. <laughs> but the thing that you can use is if you can if you can uh, incorporate cocoa powder. I talked about cocoa powder. You can incorporate that into your diet. I mean, you could sprinkle it on your cereal. I mean, I do that. I put cinnamon. I, I put all sorts of crazy stuff in my cereal. But um, if you can use cocoa powder as much as you can, that's really where you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck. And it has to be um, natural cocoa powder, which means it's non-alkalized, Peterson. One of my colleagues this morning uh, said there was an article in the paper that there's a threat to uh, chocolate supply because uh, some of the governments, especially on the Niger Coast, is preventing the shipment of chocolate. Are you worried, worrying about it? Well, it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, one of the challenges for uh, the whole cocoa supply chain is is that it comes from uh, that narrow band around the equator, which happens to also correspond to some of the less stable countries um, in, uh, in the world that don't have the kind of resources that the USDA has or other developed countries have for, for agriculture. Um, and so that, that's a challenge. Specifically in the Ivory Coast, there is a standoff that's taking place between um, uh, two rival uh, uh, politicians, both who claim victory in a recent election. And um, it recently has, uh, in, in the past, political disturbances um, occur, but cocoa is the main source of currency and, and, and uh, fuels the economy, and so it finds a way out. In this case, there actually is an export ban on cocoa. And so, um, and the reason uh, for that export ban right now um, is that the, uh, the, the man in, who's, who's um, staying in power, who was uh, democratically elected out of power, um, they're trying to freeze the funds that could go to him. And it's a very uh, tough task, and in in, you know, um, corrupt governments have many ways to, to, to access money. But that is, so there is a ban right now. And uh, it does have the industry concern because, on one hand, we'd like to see this—you know—we'd like to see the democratic process prevail. And so, if this can help, that's great. On the other hand, uh, this is the peak flow of the crop, and um, and so we're very concerned that if th that number one, it, farmers are—you know—would like the, the the funds, um, and if commerce stops as it has for the last um, three four weeks. Um, it also can have a, a, a real damaging impact on the quality of the cocoa. Um, if this lasts for a protracted period of time, absolutely it could shut down factories uh, around the world. Um, you know, for us, personally, uh, we, we uh, fortunately, we have enough physical inventory uh, to cover us through uh, August. So we've got some time to see how it evolves. Um, so that's the immediate crisis that threatens. I think, uh, as I mentioned, there's the, the broader concern that the, that the growing demand for chocolate uh, may be outpacing the ability for um, the, uh, the, the, the farmer regions to, uh, around the country to supply, and that's, that's a real issue. Well, it brings to mind the subject of Arizona's coffee or chocolate or substitutes for chocolate. Compared 
values or comparison with your real thing? Well, um, so there are um, what we what we call compound uh, chocolates or compound coatings, uh, if, if that's what you mean. So they're made with vegetable fat as opposed to cocoa butter. Is that, is that what you're referring to? Well, the, for instance, you go to a, a discount house and they have all this substitute chocolate. It's right. much, much less cost. So I'm just wondering, how do they get away with it? Yeah, I well... Mean, you, you described the fact that it's not called chocolate, it's chocolate-like. Uh, that's that's <laughs> right. Um, and, and, you know, it is for cost. And, you know, there's some applications where, you know, um, if it's an Easter bunny that, uh, you know, in a kid's Easter basket, uh, that, you know, maybe that doesn't require the same level of chocolate that would go on your Godiva, you know, uh, uh, confection. And, and but, um, so there's a, there are definitely reasons for a cheaper, less, uh, lower cost product. Um, but you can tell the difference. And, and, and by the way, from a cost standpoint, um, the cocoa butter content is uh, in a chocolate is what uh, it, they added 25% added fat. Um, the cost per pound of cocoa butter right now is probably nearing three dollars a pound, whereas uh, vegetable fat that you might use might be 80 cents a pound. So yeah, it's absolutely done for cost. There's an interesting thing in the standard of identity for chocolate only in the U.S. Um, and that is that uh, chocolate liquor which is the roasted ground bean, nothing added. Uh, in the standard of identity, that also can be called chocolate. Um, and so there, there are some companies uh, that are calling products chocolate, made with chocolate, but not adding cocoa butter and adding vegetable fats for cost. So you, you, you do have to read your label. Now, the higher end products are gonna be real and, and uh, you know with, with nothing but cocoa butter um, there are absolutely applications where you you know for functionality you might want to use a different fat and uh, it's used in the baking industry uh, in the ice cream industry uh, for ice cream coatings but um, uh, you know if you want to eat chocolate you got to read the label and make sure you know what you're getting nothing to compare with chocolate is what you're saying. <laughs> you know, you teed that up and I should have just <laughs> said that because that, that's such a great commercial for chocolate. You're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, you spoke about the quality of different chocolates from and, and, uh, parts of the world. When you roast your chocolates or you, to get chocolate, do you have different roastings depending on what, what the uh, different beans are that you get or and you do that also for the people with the firms for which you supply the chocolate what, what are their expectations if that's a two-point question well, what do they do and what do you do to prepare for that yeah it's a really good question and uh, and it's not only the origin country that can affect the flavor of the of the chocolate it's how we roast it and how we further process it we have um, over a hundred different roasting recipes uh, for once we bring the West African beans in or from Ecuador or you know any origin, uh, it's the, the time that it's in the roaster, it's the temperatures that it can be roasted at. The lower the temperature in the, in the roast, the more you're gonna keep uh, all the nuances of the, the origin uh, uh, you know, flavor grade cocoa. And the same is with, with uh, once we've roasted the cocoa beans, um, the chocolate process is really different also. We have hundreds of different recipes for milk chocolate and dark chocolate. And it's also really dependent upon uh, the percentages of sugar or uh, the cocoa mass of the chocolate or what type of milk we use, how long we conge it, what, what temperatures in the conging process. So there's so many variables all through the manufacturing process, not just uh, the origin country of, of where the cocoa comes from. That's a great question. And, and you know, the, we have some standard chocolates that we make, uh, but most often we're developing a really unique flavor profile for each of our different customers. They may have you know really specific applications in in uh, on a candy bar or in a uh, baked good or or uh, in ice cream uh, as well. 
Um, you've mentioned the farmers a couple of times, and I was just wondering, over the last couple of years, I've heard a lot more about um, raising awareness about fair trade chocolate and those sorts of practices. I was wondering, as a company, if you could speak to that. Absolutely. I think one of the great trends uh, in um, in our consuming society is a greater interest in the supply chain, in knowing where things come from, how are they sourced, and were they ethically sourced. Um, and one of the ways that uh, uh, in in agriculture, you know, one of one of the ways to ensure that there's um, uh, you know ethical sourcing, if you will. Um, is fair trade, and, and there are a lot of different um, variations on that. Um, and that's one model. There are a number of models uh, for, um, you know, we call it sustainable uh, uh, sourcing, because you know, what's sustainable, it has to be sustainable for the farmer communities, it has to be sustainable for uh, the environment, um, sustainable in terms of commerce as well. And so w we don't buy any fair trade cocoa. But we do, um, we do buy Rainforest Certified uh, Cocoa, and that has a number of criteria for sustainability and a number of criteria that we've added, um, especially around the transfer of technology to farmers, basic knowledge through farmer field schools so they can improve the yields on their farms. So, um, and that's, that's a major focus of the World Cocoa Foundation, which we uh, helped found. Actually, our grandfather founded a precursor organization called the American Cocoa Research Institute back in the 50s, and that eventually evolved into the World Cocoa Foundation, which has uh, over 100 members, and it's all of the major uh, 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 names in chocolate that you'd recognize. And that focus is on um, putting the money uh, into farmer field schools to train farmers on how to, you know, how to improve their yields, how to apply any chemicals, fertilizers in a safe way. And, and um, so it's, um, I don't know if that goes beyond your, your question. Fair trade, there's a, a big umbrella of ethical or sustainable agriculture or sourcing. And a fair trade is absolutely one very legitimate model. Our approach is not to just pay a price. We want to we want to pass on knowledge because if we're not there next year to buy their uh, to pay the the higher price, uh, we want them to still have the knowledge to achieve the higher yields, and therefore you know be able to enrich themselves in a sustainable long term way. So that that's our viewpoint. I actually had a related question. I spent Ecuador and I had the privilege of visiting a Peace Corps volunteer who was organizing a bunch of cacao farmers, small uh, farmers, into a cooperative so that they could get um, a higher price for their product because they were all essentially organic farmers, but they didn't have the certification. I mean, they, they couldn't afford pesticides, so they were organic, but they didn't have that certification, so they couldn't market it. Um, so anyway, I was just curious about how you <coughs> your connections with those small farmers and how you choose what farmers you source from? Yeah, good, great question. Again, uh, the cocoa supply chain is, is an impossibly complex uh, supply chain. When you are 15 hours in the bush in Cameroon in a pickup truck on, you know, rutted dirt track, and you see a lone farmer with one bag of cocoa and you're wondering, where is this person going? Because it's hours to the next, you know, civilization. and. Uh, and that's how it begins. You know, it's those pods and it's one bag at a time. One farmer who's got, you know, one bag after a month of harvesting. And that trickles like little tributaries into this torrent that reaches the port. And it's, it's impossible when you, when you think about it. Um, and the best way, and, and I'll tell you, it's, again, you're working in countries that don't have agricultural extension offices. They don't have the organization, typically. I mean, some do. Ghana does. Um, Ecuador is actually pretty good. It depends upon where you are. If you're in the Coca region in the Amazon basin, um, it's not well. It's, there isn't a great infrastructure of collectors and buyers, and so uh, farmers tend to not get as much value there. And so the, the key is to build those cooperatives. And one of the things that through the World Coca Foundation we work on is those marketing skills, training a farmer to know what is the value and how do you find the value 
of, of your cocoa. And one of the things, you know, with technology today, you can go into the most remote parts of the world and farmers have PDAs, they've got pagers, they've got things that tell them what the New York cocoa market is trading that day, and which is great. Um, so, but that capacity building is so critical um, in order to, for farmers to get the, the value out of what they, you know, what they produce. And it's, you know, again, even in the Ivory Coast, where there are a million farmers, um, I'd say 25% of the farmers are represented by cooperatives, and the rest sell to middlemen. It's a Lebanese uh, 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 trade, uh, I mean, that just happens to be the, you know, uh, the Lebanese traders who buy from the farmers and try to provide that structure. But we want to see more and more cooperatives developed so that the farmer has the strength um, to get the value that they, that they should get. It, it's a really great question. So do you buy from the cooperatives or from someone who bought from the cooperatives? How do you uh, bo both. And there can be lots of middlemen along the way. And we've done a lot to try to minimize the middlemen. So in Indonesia, we've, worked, we've helped create um, collection centers. So it's farmer to the collection center uh, or a cooperative, if you will. And we're buying directly from, from those centers. It's also where we, we do a lot of our training, our farm field schools. Um, in some cases, you might be a step removed from that or a step removed even further. But we're, we're trying to give, um, we're trying to give the value for the quality as close to the farmer to influence their behavior. Because as I said, if you don't ferment right, if you don't treat the crop right at the beginning, you're not going to end up with a good quality product further downstream. So. I also wanted to mention the mucusy stuff on the outside of the seed. You can actually, you guys didn't have to be eat that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really tasty. It's yeah. very sweet. <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid this is the last question, so we can also get to the reception. <laughs> I'll make it short. Uh, I'm picturing now the other end of the process, and I'm wondering what products, what form of products leave your uh, processing plants to your customers. I'm picturing giant chocolate ingots. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm curious about how you deliver your product to your customers. Yeah, um, we are an ingredient supplier. So what our company, we don't make a retail product. Um, and uh, our chocolate, the majority of our chocolate ships in liquid form. So these great big tanker trucks that are heated uh, and the liquid chocolate or cocoa butter or chocolate liquor gets pumped in 45,000 pounds, these great big stainless steel tankers that are going down the highway. So that's, I would say, uh, you know, 70 percent of our of our chocolate is, is supplied that way. Our cocoa powder is packed in 2,000 pound um, super sacks, um, and you know then a, a truckload of that goes to a customer. So it's it's in a really big scale um, that we that we supply. Well, you know, we've had some wonderful library associates events over there, but I don't think we've ever had one where we are so hopeful, so healthy, and so happy. This was an absolutely wonderful event. Peter Blummer, Stephen Blummer, Rose Potts, thank you so very much.